So thank you, Joe, and thank you, uh, I for, for the invitation. Um, I stand here in front of you, but before I dive into my topic of the day, I would like to acknowledge that my workplace is built on the lands of the Ainu people, the indigenous people of Yaun Mosir, the floating land, or Hokkaido, as the land is known nowadays. A beautiful campus in Satporo Pet, the flat land by the river, or Sapporo as it's known nowadays, has been the home for generations to uh, people. It was always a rich source of food, thanks to the river that is still running through our campus. However, it's also important to remember that the land we walk on has many stories, also challenging ones that should not be forgotten. They formed together a palimpsest uh, of um, uh, stories that uh, should uh, be remembered and perceived in our work today. So navigating polarizing discourses, cultivating values-based literacies in a multimodal society is quite a mouthful. And it might say, it seem strange that a professor of tourism and media is standing here and talking about this. My background is diverse. Uh, Japan is the eighth country that I live and work in. My original career, after I decided not to attend high school and instead get vocational education, is hospitality. I worked for about 15 years in hotels and restaurants in North America and Europe, and I'm a professional chef and uh, uh, has been working in hotels and restaurants in that fashion. Um, my second career in academia came when I uh, started uh, attending education and uh, went to university in Australia. Part of the story is I'm dyslexic, so therefore I have always had problems reading, writing, and always uh, presumed uh, that I'm absolutely stupid when I can't spell correctly. This also led me to hate school and why I uh, didn't want to go to universities. So, where am I planning to take you on this journey? Well, firstly, I'm going to talk about polarization of society and ask if it's actually real and what's involved in polarization beyond media coverage and perceptions. From there, I will move on to literacy and literacies and discuss how these concepts are perceived in society and look beyond understandings. Literacy is, as you can imagine, a topic close to my heart. And all the beautiful illustrations in this uh, presentation I have are made by my colleague Minori Inoue, who uh, also showed us that lit literary practice is so much more than just words. Uh, multimodality is part of modes and meanings, popular as a common topic in some fields of academia and simultaneously almost unknown in other fields. And there's therefore plenty of educational institutions and organizations that hold a very conservative view of how meaning is made and how it's created among their state stakeholders in terms of values and meaning making. And building on this, I will then uh, go from communication and talk about uh, found, uh, foundational philosophies, and especially talk about axiology, the philosophy of goodness and about values. And I will uh, uh, look at ways of going beyond the idea that values are subjective or objective, because values are neither. Subjective and objective comes from epistemology and not ontology, and therefore, they're uh, incoherent uh, in the thought. I will also talk about how we can uh, come to respect one another through learning about values-based education. Well, polarization or the perceptions that are commonly associated with polarization can actually be illustrated by a globe with two poles. We have, on the one hand, us, not U.S., well, that's also a poll, I'm uh, uh, sure. Uh, and on the other side, them. It's the othering of people that comes due to people seeing a disbalance 
of complexity and turbulence of diversity and power differences. These matters are always in a flux, and that's uh, a norm. However, the disbalance is exacerbated by external and internal forces, such as globalization, secularization, and uh, uh, freedom of choice. Polarization is commonly embodied through four types, ideological, political, religious, societal, geographical, economic uh, uh, polarization, those who have and those who have not, and active polariz uh, effective polarization as a, a subcategory where polarizing an opinion that is built on emotive reasoning. It can be ideological, but the full ramifications is not of an ideology, but rather a, uh, something that is easy to grasp and to get emotive about. And finally, we talk about news audience polarization. This is, of course, also a subcategory and it can be examined separately. Part of this is, for example, what we uh, heard uh, uh, Don and uh, Umberto talk about earlier, the disparage of uh, academia today and how values in academia are... Sorry, the, the uh, slide was supposed to be there earlier. Now it actually makes sense what I'm talking about. So, um, in, uh, um, in polarization, we have uh, uh, thoughts like eco chambers and filter bubbles. And eco chambers being chambers where we are uh, keeping to only a certain type of uh, uh, opinions. And the only thing we hear back is uh, uh, these people talking uh, about the same as we. They exist, but they are smaller than media quite often point them out to be. Filter bubbles is another uh, concept that comes from the idea of um, people uh, searching for certain uh, kind of content and therefore uh, are more and more bombarded through, uh, uh, through uh, the internet of the same opinions. This is true as well, and there are uh, uh, elites who are uh, giving uh, rise to this. Uh, uh, the elite of societies quite often carry the cues, like we saw so uh, closely in the COVID-19 crisis, and that we see also in climate, uh, uh, the climate change and the discussions around this. Because elites that are telling about polarizing uh, opinions do get lots of clicks, and therefore they continue also raising these topics. And there are vocal minorities that have very polarized views, and these are, uh, do exist in reality. So there are ideological, societal, effective, and news audience po uh, polarizations. But what can we do about this? Well, in order to unravel the causes of polarization, let's look at the tools that we have. Firstly, literacy and literacies have, uh, since the beginning of humankind, been how societies make sense of themselves. Traditional literacy was narrowly connected to linguistic literacy, reading, writing, communicating fluently, and it was also previously taught in societies to teach the right kind of people preferred for the utility that they brought to society. Some learn less, others learn more, and stupid people like myself who couldn't read and write properly went on and did something vocational. Um, moving to Japan some years ago was an exciting experience because uh, I became illiterate again, and uh, in the very narrow view of literacy. Different societies have, uh, are naturally literate in different ways, and there's also literacy between different societal strata. And somehow being street smart and perfectly navigate your own social sphere, but you are illiterate in another sphere. Something that popular culture like Pygmalion and My Fair Lady so clearly exemplifies. Therefore, literacy is nowadays more connected to ability to identify protocols 
and uh, uh, behaviors necessary to achieve desired purpose in a particular context. Um, I can read, I can write, I can, I can converse rudimentally in Japanese, but I'm still illiterate in many of the social cues that uh, are needed. The linguistic mode of literacy is not enough. I miss some other mode, which is important in order to, uh, to understand a particular context. Thus, the New London group in the late 90s pr uh, proposed multiliteracy as a, a, a com uh, as uh, access to evolving work, power, and community. Like the fish in the water in an apt illustration of literacy, because we are fluent in literacy protocols that our context has, we cannot uh, recognize them, but for those who uh, cannot use them, they ex stay excluded. So before I move on to multimodality, let me also highlight that all meaning uh, is conveniently named text. Text comes from Latin textere, where it means to weave. And essentially, multimodal works works as weaving together in different threads of modes that uh, uh, becomes fabrics that means something much more than the uh, simple uh, lines of uh, threads in it. We have five semiotic systems which can be constructed and co-constructed by producers and consumers. The se uh, semiotic systems in use to investigate are linguistic, as the English text that I provide on my slides, visual in Minori San's lovely images that my slide include, audio as in my voice that you are listening to, but naturally also the humming of the air conditioning and the phones and the uh, Skype messages coming in, uh, the movement of co-attendees and so much more. Gestural in me standing here and using my hands, even though I'm not talking with my hands. And uh, also, it might be that I'm signaling something, underlining or doing an emphasis. And finally, spatial in terms of personal distances, power and convenience all signify different matters together and separately. And one could naturally also further uh, use semiotic systems to examine texts created through the bodily senses, our noses, our mouth, and our skin, each othered within the Aristotelian uh, tradition of empiricism that presumed that eyes and ears are connected to the mind, whereas the rest of the body is just body. So multimodality is always a rich tapestry of separate uh, uh, modes separate meanings and constructed in different ways. As individuals, we have our personal individual literacies and our in, uh, literacy identity. It's conscious or it can be unconscious. And as different meaning-making uh, uh, entities, we also tend to prefer one over other. This might lead to a lack of comprehension of some uh, texts. The meaning by the text producer is not necessarily the same as the meaning co-constructed by the consumer of that text. Multiliteracy is therefore to have a repertoire of practices, both abilities to interpret traditional media and new media texts in different modes, additional sets in socially and culturally diverse practices. And here comes the link to values-based. In our societies, we pay a considerate amount of effort on only some modes and we disregard or relegate alternative modes of sign making to the peripheries, unevaluated and therefore not valued. The key message here is that each sign is motivated. There are no insignificant modes of communication. Two, signs are shaped by their environment. Some modes and signs are more suitable to achieve their desired purpose. And three, each mode has specific affordances. There are certain potentials in each of them. Say, for example, walking past a bakery, is it mostly potent to read the sign, to see the pictures or smell the uh, bread? Which of them is uh, what comes to your mind first? And which in this uh, multi-literate uh, uh, tapestry can we then uh, dive into? Now, linking multimodality to polarization, we can see that being multiliterate is essential to achieve a balance. 
with each mode creating meaning, it is no longer enough to explore just linguistic texts. Multimodality is everywhere, in small and everyday matters such as maps and how we visualize geographic space, but also how technology platforms are using our dependence on mobile navigation to create integrated layers of meaning, not only showing a geographic space, but also transport options, attractions, hospitality and service providers, and additionally linking this to Web 2.0 will we cr uh, create a common understanding of goodness of any of these geographical locations. Ooh, that restaurant is 3.6, that is 4.2, that must be better. By coming to Japan and learning about cultural norms in Japan, such as the importance of cleanliness, where even the word for beautiful, kirei, being the same as the word for clean, we are learn about the essence of being clean and of Japanese baths, where one washes oneself first outside the bath before stepping into the bath clean to warm up the body. Thus, the little towel, the bath uh, on the head of bathers, is never used to clean themselves in the bath, as in some other cultures. So, what is called over-tourism in many other countries is called tourism pollution in Japan. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Being the meeting of different cultures and the different values gives us the perfect bridge to move on to the final theoretical concept, axiology, and how values-based acts and foundation you know, for both being and meaning. Now, many of you in the audience have surely come across ontology and epistemology in your work, or maybe sidelined it in your studies, or, uh, but I dare to say that fewer of you are familiar with the third foundational uh, philosophy, axiology. Even though I claim it to be the most fundamental to society. Just as a short reminder for those of uh, you who simply touched on this in your studies, never to return to them thereafter, you thought. Ontology is meaning-making. When we ask an ontological question, we ask, what is there to know? Epistemology, on the other hand, investigates knowledge and truth. And if we ask an epistemological question, we ask, how do we know? Axiology is the uh, philosophy of values and of goodness. And we ask axiological questions when we ask why we know. I guess most of you would agree when I say that the emphasis in society at large, but especially in educational institutions, is on the second philosophy, epistemology. The never-ending debates about truth and accumulation of knowledge is very much how modernity has valued these dimensions as our foundation. But I want to challenge this because, radically, nothing comes before values. Now, before objections, listen me out. Societies, not only human, but also more than human, exist through shared values. Values are not always explicitly pronounced but they are acted. The way values work is through action. We wake up every day, we live our daily lives through evaluations, that what we are doing. Whether to wake up early or late, whether to take a bath or not, whether to eat breakfast or not, to walk or drive to school or work and so on, we live through values. And this is important because values are not just airy-fairy things that we wish we do. Values are lived in the acts. We act them out in our everyday lives. Thus, let us first get rid of the first hurdle. People are complaining that values are either subjective or objective. Well, they're neither, because that is a metaphysical fallacy. Axiology is conflated either with epistemology and subjective properties, or conflated with ontology and the illusion that values are things or matters. Values are therefore not consequences that emerge in human action, and are available to be experienced, but they are the foundation for each person's actual world, underpinning, propelling, and constituting human action in practice. Thus, by focusing on acts and action, radical axiology is oriented towards the future. As the world is created by human actions, then the future is being formulated by values. Our values guide our desires and actions, and therefore transform our epistemologies as well as our actions towards ontologies. 
Therefore, avoiding the metaphysical fallacy does not mean that axiology becomes separated from ontology and epistemology. Instead, axiology forms the ground for the formation and transformation of ontology, uh, ontological and epistemological realities. Hartman also identified that there are other axiological fallacies describing different and conflicting conceptualizations of value. The naturalistic fallacy conflates axiology with other sciences, for example, in values-based research with a managerial focus where goodness is confused with subjective perceptions and with satisfaction, such as in consumer studies. The moral fallacy conflates axiology and moral goodness. Values are quite commonly considered in relation to ethics, but axiology provides the principle of value and is a method which shows how we think when we value, not what we ought to think. For example, stealing is considered morally bad, but that does not close out the option of somebody being good at being a thief. Instead of moralizing the phenomenon, axiology helps to clarify how each action is underpinned by different kinds of outcomes, some creating more goodness, some less. To avoid the naturalistic fallacy and the moral fallacy, Hartman summarized four positions of using values. The ontological position, the psychological position, the sociological position or anthropological position, and value as non-referential statements. The existing literature is mainly based on the first three positions by viewing values as ontological properties, as epistemological experiences, or as properties of specific entities. In contrast, axiology helps us conceptualize the fourth position, viewing value as non-referential statements that can be applied to everything and can be adopted by anyone, consciously or unconsciously, in their actual practices. But what is then value as a non-referential statement? Well, it is when we think of something that is good for its own sake, not in reference to anything else. This can be explained through the axiom of goodness, which forms a value hierarchy. In formal axiology, goodness indicates a concept fulfillment. Concepts show ideal features or standards that things are supposed to have. Good things must have good-making properties that fit their concepts. Axiological values therefore indicate the correspondence between properties of things and concepts that people apply to them. There are three levels of axiological values, systemic, extrinsic, and intrinsic. Systemic values fulfill formal concepts, but are based on ideas or agreements. Evaluating with systemic values is often based on a dichotomy seeing things as either perfect or imperfect. Therefore, systemic value only contains finite good-making properties. Secondly, abstract concepts are also constructed, however, based on things from the concrete world. Extrinsic values, fulfilling abstract concepts, compromise properties in common of members of a category and focus on comparison. It means that extrinsic values have contain infinite, however discontinuous, good-making properties. Thirdly, singular concepts contain all the properties of an individual being or person. Intrinsic values indicate the value of being itself and is uh, based on identification. It also means that intrinsic value contains infinite and continuous good-making properties, that is, life. Focusing on a number of good-making properties, Hartman pointed out a hierarchy of the three value dimension. It said that intrinsic value is more important than extrinsic, which is more important than systemic. Taking this now back to my discussion on polarization and literacies, let me initially separate values into two larger subsections. Firstly, we have lived values, which constitute how we make sense of ourselves and our surrounding realities. These lived values can roughly be broken into political, economic, cultural, social, and ecolo ecological values. Each of these dimensions coexist and influence how societies and individuals live their lives. The other subsection of values are aspirational values, or those that we attain to or wish for. These values include ethics, aesthetics, and values that are considered universal. 
Much research on personal values or corporate values are purely focused on these aspirational values and forget or disregard lived values. I'm doing the opposite. I mainly investigate lived values and how they influence literacies and underpin the dialogue in the world. Yeah. Thus, I'm now coming back full circuit to polarization and what we should do to minimize the negative effects of these. Well, first we need to foster a distinctly values-based society and steer away from suggestions of value ne neutrality, as we can now see that this is purely an epistemologically inspired value bias statement. All research is values-based and all education is values-based. That is the whole point. We live through values. What we evaluate to be important enough to teach or focus our research activities on is what we, or if we are blind to our own agency, what society's values. Thus, polarization does not happen because we have different values. Values are not the culprit. Polarization happens because we have different ontological worldviews in which we, uh, our perceived reality needs to function in certain ways. Polarization happens because of epistemological conservatism to determine that the, and there are right and wrong answers in social sciences is delusional, in the same way as talking about fully universal non-physical truth. By determining a right or wrong in society is always based on a values-based determination. Our laws and mores, our manners and fashions are all values-based and based on how we have determined that ultimate goodness for whatever concept is in question is created. Therefore, in an openly values-based society, we can come to respect differences by accepting that a total consensus is in not, uh, not in anybody's interest, what Lyotard calls a différent, where conflict cannot be equitably solved. By realizing that our world is created by action, and that action is motivated by values, we can shape the ontologies that we prefer, and we can influence the epistemologies that are in action. So by not striving for a complete consensus, we can start by acknowledging what goodness different participants are striving for, and by what mode they signify this goodness. This gives us the flexibility to evaluate different meaning-making modes and rather than holding on to just one mode of meaning making, we can create a third language, or maybe rather a textual space. This is done not by focusing on systemic values that are simply ideas, by focusing on intrinsic values, life values that keep us alive. Finally, it's good to be reminded by the words of Wittgenstein when referring to the different opinions in society and him saying, some sand and gravel might be necessary at times to proceed, because walking on ice is too difficult otherwise. And I know that this metaphor makes absolutely no sense in Indonesia, because you probably don't have the experience of walking on ice. But let me assure you, up in Hokkaido, that is an everyday occurrence throughout winter. Suddenly the road turns into ice, and a little bit of sand and gravel to create some friction is exactly what we need to get forward. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor. We have um, some time for some questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. There's one down here. Uh, thank you. That was lovely. And I think, uh, you know, uh, very well uh, sort of uh, complicated and thought out. But I would like to do is have you talk a little bit about practical applications. In other words, you teach about tourism. So take the concepts that you've been discussing and now apply it in a very practical way to what you want your own students to be able to achieve or to at least uh, to embody. Wonderful. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, amongst my teaching methods, I teach something called film and tourism, uh, in which we sit together with students and watch films, and then we're using different philosophies to, uh, to, to tear apart the films 
and see what it is that is being portrayed. And we look at different films that portrays tourism in different ways. Not so that we could see what tourism does to societies, but rather turn it around to see how popular culture creates tourism in uh, the students' minds. So learning about why do we think that tourism is what uh, that we think that it is. And then asking students to do their own films where they take a small project and learn about something tourism related and point out what kind of values stands behind this. Why do we buy souvenirs? Why do we go to certain attractions? And then use this in order to learn how values are applied in society. Um, wow, this is the most silent you guys have been for the whole time that we've been in here. There's always been a little discussion. <laughs> The, the beauty of humanities and of thinking is, of course, that we need to pause and we need to actually think, how does this work for me? Because there's, there isn't anything more practical than a good theory. I, I'd also like to um, uh, perhaps get you to, to talk a bit about um, how this uh, reflects with your own personal then journey from being engaged and involved in the tourist industry in um, Australia and then in academia and then moving and shifting that the other way into Japan. So what are some of those um, things around values that you found within this particular culture and context? Because a lot of the people um, uh, attending this conference, for, for many of them, this is the first time they're visiting Japan. So perhaps you could talk a bit to that specifically. Yeah. Tourism is quite often seen as more or less a, a universal thing, something everybody has access to. Uh, according to statistics, 15% of the world's population has access to tourism. 85% of the world's population do not. Tourism requires three things. Uh, that you have enough money, that you have enough time and that you have the political freedom to leave your home. For 85% of the population in the world, that does not exist. Either you might have the time, but you don't have the money, or you might have both the time and the money, but you are not allowed to leave where you come from. And this is an uh, important part, because in Western societies, in, uh, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, Tourism is seen as a norm, but also within uh, developed economies, tourism is also something that is polarizing. And times of holidays is, in many cases, the worst time for kids from poorer families, because that is when everybody starts talking about what are you going to do on the vacation, and they know that they are going to sit at home, because that is what... Uh, uh, that they have to choose from. So I've been uh, working in uh, hospitality and tourism education uh, in Australia and then uh, in Finland and in Norway. And uh, like Umberto, I walked away from a management position because I could no longer live with myself in uh, uh, teaching within a neoliberal university that purely put focus on the, the, the realities of economy. So coming to Japan was very much a break for me because the beauty of Japanese universities is they are conservative. And this might sound weird, but conservatism in Japan is still a way that we stay away from neoliberalism. So I can teach pretty much whatever I want. I can teach it in whichever mode I want. I can uh, assess students in any way I want, and I can research whatever I want. As long as I do that, I have the academic uh, freedom to do it. 
I have never had this freedom anywhere else in the world. Because in most parts of the world, universities are turning into corporate health. Where in Australia, I was told we are only going to publish in these journals. You are not to publish outside. And for me, with a PhD in cultural studies stuck in a business school, that didn't really work. Because the, the sort of stuff that I was uh, uh, writing didn't fit in any business journals or regular tourism journals. So oh, the beauty with Hokkaido University is we don't have an undergraduate degree in tourism. Instead, I get to teach kids from all of university. And for many of them, it's going to be the first and last time they think of tourism as an academic field. But at the same time, I know that all of them are then going on to become engineers and veterinarians and so on with the greater understanding of the complexity that tourism is. Thank you. That's a great answer. Any There's one at the back. Thank you, Professor. My name is Edward. I am wrong. Um, I was finding it difficult to follow you, actually. <laughs> um, but on the slide, um, the bullet point, you mentioned that our, our world is created by action. The future is, uh, uh, please, no. The last one. Oh. Is that, yeah, exactly what Sorry. I was here. But uh, you mentioned the conflictual relationship between etymology and ontology. So epistemology is the, is the question of what is. And your research area of what you teach at the moment has something to do with climate change. Mm. So... Climate change is a question of what is. We, can, we, we, we need a conceptual definition of climate change. And that means there must be a deliberate attempt. So the question of what is, we need to conceptualize. So in that case, the, for, for us to have a certain future where we need to address the fundamental problems of, of climate, change, climate change and all its um, other related issues, we need scientific thinking, and that we need the, we have to address the the question of epistemology and ontology. But my understanding is you kind of have uh, the conf conflictual relationship between ontology and epistemology. So it gets me confused a bit. If you can clarify that kind of uh, um, intricacies, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That is a wonderful question. And uh, uh, no, the, the, I, I do not disparage either epistemology on, uh, or in, uh, ontology. Both of them are definitely needed. A and I'm sure all of us are perfectly happy about that physics does exist. And we want uh, the students who are studying engineering to actually understand physical laws so that the bridges that we drive on and the, the airplanes that we sit in actually stay up and don't fall. So from that perspective, reality exists and there are laws to it. And the, the point that I uh, was trying to make is rather that we see this as the be all uh, of goodness, that as long as we have enough knowledge, everything will be solved. And then we start to see things as black and white as either true or false, which can be uh, uh, quite uh, correct. If I now step a couple of steps, I will probably fall off this stage. And that is a physical reality. However, the, the point here is that that is not all of it. It's the action of me walking over to, into the edge of the stage that is, uh, uh, first of all, creating this action. So... But by looking at what is it within our philosophies that really creates our knowledge about what is valuable in the world. And here value takes on the different nuances that we so often see. We, we have, like our earlier speakers, talked about 
the, the importance of a university degree being valuable, being valuable from a mechanistic perspective, being valuable in society's eyes, being valuable because of the extra salary that you get. So all of these values are presumed to bring a certain goodness. And what we need to learn more about is to learn how other people see goodness. What kind of goodness is it that you want from your life? And when we learn about what goodness another person uh, wants, that is when we can start to have discussion. Because if we presume that everybody has the same perception of goodness as we have, then we are only going to talk in our uh, uh, echo chamber. But when we realize that goodness looks very different for different uh, uh, people, that is when we uh, start to make it. Uh, uh, track uh, of changes. So I work on uh, climate change and I work lots with indigenous communities and what we uh, look at there is how indigenous communities have had indigenous values for a very long time and they had it right from the beginning. And now in uh, our universities we need to relearn and uh, actually see how these values can help us forward. So thank you for a brilliant uh, question. Okay, thank you, for Professor. Uh, I am Ima Hayu uh, from Indonesia, uh, Surabaya State University. I'm fine. And then uh, I have two questions. And then the first, those who use literacy take it for granted, but about this, who can use it are excluded. In, uh, as your slide, is it right? And then, what does it mean about the excluded? And then, a uh, second question. Uh, this as the word moved to work in the era industrial revolution 4.0 and uh, digital literations. Uh, has become is a crucial skill uh, for student in uh, 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 this twenty uh, first century. Is it like? And then uh, the patterns, uh, the pattern students, uh, the pattern student uh, readiness in developing the uh, necessary to uh, to uh, uh, to navigate to navigate uh, uh, rapidly involving technologies and landscape. And we know that the students, you know, in Indonesia especially, uh, like uh, uh, social media and gaming is and looking to this, uh, looking to uh, uh, for academic and uh, for academic and uh, professional applications uh, technology. And we know that uh, uh, this. Uh, apa? He has one minute to answer you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, the globalization, and we know digitalization as uh, the uh, the student, uh, uh, and looking to uh, false uh, perceptions about the confidence to using ability digital skill, and what uh, what should we do? Uh, what should we do like a, a teacher? Uh, about this problem. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, co congratulations on uh, your new president who uh, became president essentially by using social media and uh, learning how to dance on TikTok to uh, attack a different. So uh, essentially, uh, social media is very uh, 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 powerful in this. And uh, those who are literate uh, take it for granted, but those who are uh, uh, cannot use it are excluded. And this is very much the case in terms of uh, turning political opinion, because not being literate means that you can use it, but you can't uh, examine it. So one of the first things that we should do as teachers is actually to teach multiliteracies and to teach multimodality and to teach students how different modes are creating meaning in different ways. So when we have the person who has been applying um, tried to become president for several times, but always was voted down based on different uh, facts. But then when he turns to social media and starts to dance to tacky videos, 
suddenly become popular amongst the young uh, generation, then we have a problem because multiliteracy is, is not involved there and people don't see the uh, different multimodal messages.